the variegated meadowhawk. I talked about them being the toughest one out there. And uh, so I use them as sort of my mascot. This is a view from actually a Mesilla Valley Bosque State Park. I, I liked it a lot and showed a little bit about the, the, um, the feel of the river as it's flowing in this area. Uh, some of the habitat, pecan groves, Oregon mountains, nice clouds. I, I like this image a lot. And this is what I was talking about, this, this sort of tremendous biodiversity that using uh, milkweed plants, uh, world milkweed in this case. And just in this one fo photo, we've got a, a couple of leaf cutter bees, these small guys, and they're, they are not large enough to be pollinators. Uh, we've got a really large tarantula hawk wasp here. We have a pair of, of Ashmead's digger wasps, and we've got a variegated fritillary butterfly, all feeding in this, just this one little frame. And it's amazing the bi biodiversity that you see going along that trail. Many people uh, bike it, hike it, they go by real fast. And literally within two steps of the trail is all of this stuff going on. Again, we're talking about the La Llorona Trail. It's part of a much longer Rio Grande Trail, but uh, we're only gonna look at, at a, about a five mile segment along the Rio Grande. Uh, we start at 359, Highway 359. If you go this way, you hit Mesilla Valley Bosque State Park to put you in perspective. Um, and this is Interstate 10, to give you an idea. Now, one thing you notice, if you look at the river, it has straight edges. That's because the river was turned into actually a canal. In 1938 to 1943, under the Rio Grande Canalization project and it was part of the um, the uh, water agreements with Mexico that were developed in 1906 to deliver uh, a certain number of acre feet of water to Mexico via the Rio Grande and the only way they could achieve that was to literally turn the river into a canal. Um, for overflow waters there's a levee bank there's this is a levee road this is a levee road and the distance across these levee roads can be almost a half mile, about 2,100 feet. The distance across the canal, the channel, is typically about 300 feet to 500 feet. Uh, you do notice that we have a little bit of flow in here, even though this is an, uh, an off irrigation season, off summer photo. And that's because just above here, we have the Las Cruces wastewater treatment plant uh, dumping their uh, treated water into the canal. And you notice when water has its opportunity, it likes to meander, form little islands and that sort of thing. And you can see how it has to go flush against these banks. These banks are made out of riprap, big rock riprap, and now they're anchored all together by the roots of sandbar willow and salt cedar trees and tall shrubs primarily. The, um, the actual bike path starts right here and runs along this side of the canal. You got the sign, notice enter at your own risk, and many, many people go in here, and this is uh, under the jurisdiction of the USIBWC. Picacho Peak for reference, this is the levee road, and you notice this large overflow area uh, before you actually reach or, or can see, observe the, the river channel that's, of course, now the canal. A lot of herbaceous vegetation out here, a lot of grasses, a lot of forbs, a lot of weedy stuff, but this is really important habitat for species like wasps and bees who build their burrows out here also. A, a lot of ants burrowed in out here. So a lot of the species that use the milkweeds along here actually have burrows out here. Start of the, um, the, the bike path, walking path, however you want to call it. Uh, they did introduce some trees, some cottonwood trees, which had a little bit habitat structure. And in the wintertime, uh, a lot of raptors use these trees for, uh, for perches. A lot of Bermuda grass uh, along the edge and forbs. And then these, these uh, willows can be 25, 30 feet tall and form a pretty solid stand. 
This is a nice little view of the river. It's got a little bit of islands. The, the water level has dropped. Uh, I keep debating whether to call it a canal or a river. I, I think we maybe should change the name to the Grand Canal instead of the, the Rio Grande. Picacho Peak again, and uh, some nice New Mexico sky right there. This is a uh, small patch of whorled milkweed right here. It's late in the season, it's all in fruit. These willows may be 30 feet tall and it's just a solid stand in some places. As you look around the bike path, again, willow shrubs, but here is a solid stand of tamarisk or salt cedar. Um, I suspect they would love to get rid of that and make it all willow, but uh, they're very, very, very hard to, to get rid of. Again, these habitats out here are where, um, where some of the wasp bees and, and certainly ants burrow and, and maintain their homes. Um, kind of midway in this first segment is a small drainage ditch that takes, takes water from uh, irrigation fields, irrigated fields, and flows towards the river. And this is a great place to find things like dragonflies and, and damselflies and uh, a bunch of semi-aquatic aquatic insects that are predators on a lot of the species that use the milkweed. Um, and there are little patches and strips of whorled milkweed on both sides of this little drainage ditch. Looking towards the I-10 bridge, Doniana Mountains, um, there are breaks in the willow patches and stands that have emergent vegetation, usually three square bulrush or southern cattail. Um, this cattail bulrush. And then um, there's quite a bit of Johnson grass and a little bit of Phragmites, the common reed, that grow along here and they add a, a different habitat perspective. This is a, just as solid a stand of sandbar willow as you're ever going to see. Great place for birds to nest in the spring and summer. Um, and then all of these nesting birds have all these babies to feed and this area is just chock full of grasshoppers and and all sorts of other uh, critters that, that the birds pick up and, and take to their nests. The second little segment that we talk about is the I-10 bridge to State Highway 70 in La Llorona Park. I'm sure you've all visited, have been about, is, about, is right here at Highway 70. And this is the outfall ditch from the wastewater treatment plant that adds a kind of a permanent flow at the southern end and into Mesilla Valley, Bosque State Park over the winter time. The I-10 bridge, bank to bank flow, and you can see how, how narrow the habitat is. But even this narrow habitat, uh, this is a composite that I always forget the name of, that it flowers profusely, draws in a lot of insects to forage. This is the outlet uh, ditch, if you want to call it that, or outlet, outlet canal for the water treatment plant and the bridge that crosses it. Again, this is a, um, this is a great place for um, uh, semi-aquatic, aquatic insects. And also along all of these edges, back this way, over this way, and back this way, are, are bands and patches of whorled milkweed. You can see where the treated water beats the river, flows in, you got all of this sediment laden water from um, Caballo Dam upstream um, and, and the flow along the way. Here's the clear water coming out of the treatment plant, floating aquatic habitat, willows, a little bit of emergent southern cattail vegetation, highly diverse area of semi-aquatic and, and uh, other insects. This was the overflow event of, of 2019. It happened on October 6th. There was a huge thunderstorm and hatch on October 5th. Um, and as the bikers got to go ahead and ride through and get the backs of their uniforms, their, their shirts muddy, and I bet that made them feel really good. Over time, though, the flies really moved in here and started to breed, and this became the best place to find dragonflies that you'll ever, ever see in your life um, for photography. Okay, south looking north into La Llorona Park. And again, uh, this habitat, even though it's grassy, a um, little bit weedy and mown, is very important to, to uh, wasp bees and other burrowing insects. 
from La Llorona Park to St. Highway 70 Bridge. This bridge has so many swallow nests on it. It's unbelievable. These swallows, uh, barn swallows, cliff swallows, fly around and forage on a lot of the small insects that feed on, on milkweeds. The last segment is the St. Highway 70 Bridge to this outfall, which is the large drainage ditch that goes all the way up to Telshore Avenue or Telshore Boulevard and empties into the, into the Rio or the canal there. So in, the, in La Llorona Park, looking towards State Highway 70 Bridge, all maintained grasslands and every, or grasses, I should say, mostly Bermuda grass um, and a few other mixed in there. But there's just a little tiny strip of habitat that insects use along the, along the edge. Uh, looking south into the park, again, these habitats are really important to burrowing insects and every opening like this, and then in behind these shrubs, you'll find uh, little strips of whorled milkweed. Over the tops of some of these shrubs, you'll find climbing milkweed. A little further up, an older stand of whorled milkweed. This was the flood event of October 6th. You see the flowering is all done here, but look at how much sediment was put into that water from that flooding event upstream around Hatch. This is the end of the La Llorona Trail. And this is the ditch, the Oregon Mountains, towards the Oregon Mountains. This, this ditch trail, you can take all the way up to uh, Telshore Boulevard. Um, and in the summertime in particular, it's a great habitat for semi-aquatic, aquatic, and other insects. And little strips of world milkweed uh, grow along some of these, these edges. This bank is too steep for you to get down and take good photos, but it's still interesting to see the uh, insects interact. And even little places with a little bit of water, uh, here's some uh, cattle egrets have come in to, to try to catch tadpoles and um, all the other uh, insect larvae, adult insects, whatever they can get their beaks around. This is where that ditch drains into the, into the reel. Okay, now we're going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about a little bit of the use along the Rio. Of course, we have the habitat um, that can be used by wildlife and the, both the water and the uh, vegetation. We have some happy bikers and people who walk and people who run and we have people on horses. Um, we have people who enjoy the day of the dead and all summer long, this was the happiest person I saw, just ear to ear grin all summer. Really fun to, uh, to uh, get to know him. Um, the water's used, we have kayaking, a lot of tubing, uh, a lot of people stationed here at La Llorona Park to go ahead and take off into the water. So it gets used quite a bit and people actually swim there. Now in the fall, after the um, water level drops and all we have is the outflow from the water treatment plant, the four-wheel drive folks take over pretty much and, and run up and down uh, the river, uh, the, the canal bed quite frequently, often kicking up a lot of dust when it's dry. Um, and some of them even want to drive through that treated wastewater, and I'm not so sure I would do that if I owned one of those units. Um, there is a little bit of impact to some of the larvae of the aquatic insects, semi-aquatic insects, because they hang out along these, um, along, along these banks and shorelines and that sort of thing. A um, little bit of research. I ran into a, a young man who was doing research out there in April of this year, and this was a setup to catch black flies, and uh, they were doing a genetic study on the black flies uh, related to their effect on livestock in the area. So that's out of New Mexico State University. Um, like I say, the area between the levee and the canal is mown in June and October. This is City of Las Cruces Parks that does the maintenance. This is a little ruby spot damselfly. He's helping me out tonight too. And he, he actually became my favorite insect of the whole summer. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the plants. This is uh, climbing milkweed, Finasterum sinancoides. And uh, Finasterum means twining vine or twin vine, and uh, they definitely do twine. Uh, 
Uh, flowers produce an extreme amount of nectar, which draws in many, many, many insects and then all of the predators of those insects. It can vine over fairly, uh, fairly thin vegetation like this little stand of cattails, or it can make huge mats over the, over the uh, sandbar willows and lead plants and, and uh, other shrubs, uh, some of the salt cedar and things like that. This little space right here, there are seven painted lady butterflies feeding, foraging on these flowers, uh, picking up nectar, and then who knows how many bees and ants are in there. And on every flower, you can always see something. It doesn't matter how many photos you take. Here's a little fly feeding here. Here's an ant feeding here. Um, if you, once you break these uh, down and enlarge them, you're gonna find something on these flowers. Um, late summer, actually early autumn, the um, pollinated flowers form fruits. They have this characteristic pointed, characteristic and uh, really beautiful to photograph the seeds as they're emerging out of the uh, out of the fruit or the follicle of climbing milkweed. And you even get a little color show. So that's pretty cool in late autumn. Um, in the wintertime, these old skeletons hang over the willow shrubs and these are very important thermal and hiding shelter for small overwintering birds from, from raptors. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's an awful lot of cocoons and and uh, places where insects have uh, eggs and larvae underneath these as well. So it's a uh, good habitat all, all year round. Okay, let's look a little bit at world milkweed. Very beautiful flower and uh, very fun to photograph. They form bands and little patches behind the wettest vegetation. So here's a really nice stand that really attracts a lot of of insects throughout time. Again, I'd say they're about two to three feet tall. Uh, one of the things when you're photographing insects on these plants is it's almost always breezy or windy and these are always waving around. So it's good to have a camera. The one I was testing had a stabilizer in the body and a stabilizer in the lens and that really helped to freeze the action uh, to the uh, uh, of the insects swaying in the breeze on the flower and you'll see some of that photography later on. This is really typical shot of around 9, 10 in the morning. This is the very first monarch butterfly I saw. And all last year, I only saw about 12 to 15 monarchs. Um, and then it's, it's sharing the habitat, the painted lady and uh, tarantula hawk wasp and other wasps. This stand is interesting because uh, here it is late in the season. It's all in, in, uh, in uh, throwing seeds out of fruits but it's right in front of a nice large stand of cattail which breaks the wind. And so this is a very warm spot in the fall. And this is the only place I found caterpillars of monarch butterflies. Um, I, there were five of them that used this stand last year. Late in the season, we have somebody out looking for food, but unfortunately they're all fruits and, and, uh, and uh, seeds flying away. You got the bud stage, the open flower stage, the old flower stage, and some pollination happens, so we have some fruits. These have beautiful fruits and, and beautiful seeds. Um, wonderful to go out and, and, uh, and photograph. Now let's talk just a little bit about pollination. Pollination on milkweeds is pretty weird. I hadn't really thought about it before I started this little project, but it takes a certain, certain kind of species of insect to pollinate a, a milkweed plant. So let's look a little closer at the uh, climbing milkweed flower. We're going to focus on this area right here. This is the, the um, stigmatic disc. This little groove right here is a stigmatic slit. And this little black dot is a corpusculum. And those are all very important. Let's take a look at the same thing on coral milkweed, which we can see just a little bit easier. Stigmatic disc, stigmatic slit, corpusculum. Attached to the corpusculum are two little arms called translators. These are the anthers. Inside the anthers are two sacs, a pollen sac on each side. 
And uh, the pollen sacs each contain about 100 to 200 grains of pollen uh, within them, but they're in a unit. So an insect with a leg or mouth parts large enough to go to the bottom of the stigmatic slit and be drawn all the way up and pull the sacs of pollen, which are called pollinia, out by these translators is what is required to uh, help transfer the pollen from one flower to another. Um, the, in this case, you see one flower that has not yet had a pollinator that was able to do that. And here you see that the corpusculum and translators are missing. That means that uh, an insect with the right attributes to pull a leg up through here uh, was able to remove those pollen sacs. Um, there are hairs inside the stigmatic slip that point upward so that once an insect starts moving its leg up, it can't push it back down. So it's a very, very neat adaptation. A little bit of a diagram here, what we're talking about, stigmatic disc, the anther, stigmatic slit, here are pollinium, translators, corpusculum, and then this whole thing right here is called a pollinarium. And that has to, has to be pulled out by a proper sized insect in order to pollinate another flower. One thing in this study that really intrigued me is there was a 1982 study that looked at bumblebees and they said once a bumblebee picked up a pollinia out of a flower, it took a thousand subsequent visits for it to be transferred to another flower for pollination. And I thought that was just, just extremely amazing information. A uh, little bit of a diagram, here's that stigmatic slit. Here we have the translator arms, the corpusculum, and these are the pollinia that would normally be inside the anther. Again, corpusculum, translators, pollinia. That whole unit has to be pulled out in order to transfer pollen to another flower. Pretty, pretty complicated. Even this guy got a little weirded out by that thing. Now here are our pollinators. Our, our, I have them sort of as potential pollinators. In this case, the monarch butterfly. Um, potential pollinator number one, because the one that I recorded only had one pair of pollinia on its, its foot. And there were only maybe 12 or 15 that I saw all season. Now there may have been more when I wasn't there, but there just weren't that many around. Uh, the variegated fritillary had the same thing, one pollinia attached to a foot. So it could be a pollinator, but I wouldn't bank on having a lot of pollination getting done with that species. Orange sulfurs, this one's facing off with an assassin bug, so better be careful. Again, um, the, the thing about orange sulfurs is even though uh, this particular one doesn't have very many pollinia, there are many, many of them all season long. And so uh, just the mass of numbers of individuals might make them a potential pollinator. And here you see plenty attached on these, on these legs. A little um, butterfly called the bordered patch. Again, only maybe perhaps I saw two or three of them had a few plenty attached to a foot. Now the larger butterflies are a little bit different story. This is a black swallowtail. And these are flutter feeders. They constantly fluttering their wings and they go around the, the, um, the uh, ball of flowers, on, on this case, world milkweed, constantly fluttering. They're tough to take photos of. You have to just snap, snap and snap away to get lots of images to get a couple that are good. But you can see that on every foot, you have a mass of pollinia even all the way up to here on this leg. This, uh, it's really about the second joint. So this species, and there, there are a fair number at times during the season, is a, put, a potential pollinator. But the real champion among the butterflies in terms of picking up pollinia was this great purple hair streak. Um, and it 
picked up really nice masses just round around those flowers. It was really hard to take pictures of sometimes because it was so close to the flower head. The only problem with this one is this is the only one I saw for the whole summer. So while it may have pollinated a few flowers, it was all by its lonesome. An interesting one for me was a corn earworm moth, usually moths feed in the, in the evening and at night, and I was out in the mornings to about noon. Um, but here on World Milkweed, this corn earworm moth was carrying pollinia. Here's a really nice pair on this back leg, and there are more here in, in, in that leg. And, and so uh, it could potentially pollinate a few flowers. And here it is on climbing milkweed. Again, carrying a nice batch of pollinia, and so again, could, could pollinate some flowers. Um, one beetle came forward and, and uh, could really be a potential pollinator. Now this is a green June beetle or a green fig beetle. And uh, they're very large and they really feed uh, uh, resolutely around that flower. And so every foot has a batch of pollinia associated with it, some on this back foot. And so I'm pretty sure this is a, a good pollinator for the time that they're out there. The smallest um, insect that really is an effective pollinator is the honeybee. So if you know something about the size of a honeybee, uh, here's one on climbing milkweed. And you can see that it's got pollinia on this foot, a couple out on this foot some on this foot and on this foot. They do collect plenia quite well. They, they really are, are uh, fastidious feeders when they're on the flower. But uh, there has been documentation of honeybees um, getting their legs stuck in that stigmatic slit and being cannibalized by predators or actually dying on the flower or having to break their leg off in order to travel further. So, so uh, they're really the minimum size that make a good pollinator for, for milkweed. Here we see how many pollinia this one has picked up. It's just this massive amount. And so I'm, I'm definitely putting honeybees on the, on the list of, of uh, really good pollinators for milkweeds. In April, the other thing about them, there are many, many of them. April, this swarm uh, showed up and landed in, in a salt cedar right next to the bike path. What was really fun about this, even though it was before milkweed's flower, uh, is that this whole mass would just like almost like a heartbeat. It would just um, just go in and out like a heartbeat. And it was really fun to watch. And they weren't aggressive, thank goodness, but uh, stuff you see along the bike path. Here are honeybees sharing some flower space with a weevil wasp. And you can see they're about the same size. This honeybee too is collecting pollinia. This was a, a one-off on a climbing milkweed flower. This is the only time I saw this nominee bee. Very pretty pure brown bee, but uh, it was uh, picking up pollinia. So if it had been there long enough, it may have pollinated uh, a flower or two while it was there. Large bees are, are um, really common out there and the large bees in the New Mexico area can be pretty weird and not a lot of people know their taxonomy very well so you're going to see me write down large brown bee unknown a lot but they they visit through the summer and they're really good at picking up pollinia and are definitely flower pollinators you're familiar with the female carpenter bee here on World Milkweed, you can see all of the plenty it's picked up on its feet. And it's definitely a good potential or a good pollinator, I would say, not even potential. The male carpenter bee looks quite different, brown and fuzzy, but it is a massive collector of plenia. And so if there are enough of these around, they can really do uh, some good pollination effort uh, when they grind through those flowers looking for the nectar. Sonoran bumblebee. There are a fair number around, um, not a huge number, but they do pick up a good amount of pollinia, and I think that they're a good pollinator uh, as they move through uh, milkweed flowers. Another large brown bee that I don't know the species of, a massive amount of pollinia, and an excellent potential, or I think an excellent pollinator, not any potential. The wasps 
are the happening place for pollination though. Um, this is a paper wasp and they are common to abundant throughout the summer and they are all over these flowers all the time. And they do more than take the nectar, they also uh, pick up larvae and, and, and uh, other insects, uh, young and things like that. This is a weevil wasp, short legs and all. But even this short-legged weevil wasp is picking up pollinia, has the potential to pollinate. Digger wasp, called ash meets digger wasp, really colorful. These are really pretty to see and there's lots of them out there. Um, again, a really good grabber of pollinia and uh, I think a definite pollinator. The very large, almost two inch long tarantula hawk wasp, uh, these will wake you up when you see them and, and there's certainly nothing to play with. This pair is uh, going through uh, milkweeds, very long legs that cover the whole, the whole thing. They show a little pollinia there on this pair, but this individual tarantula hawk wasp shows you how many they really can pick up with every leg having pollinia associated with it. And they hit these um, flowers hard starting about 8 39 o'clock when the temperature gets up around 80 to 85 degrees and they just grind through the flowers picking up again nectar but also um, other small uh, larvae and, and, and things that they can eat plenty on these legs all the way through and very long legs they can definitely pull a pull a leg through those uh, stigmatic slits this is the winner of the tarantula hawk wasp. Absolute garbage person when it comes to picking up plenty. It got them all. There were some that were all black. I think they're probably the same species and just a color morph of the tarantula hawk wasp. Uh, and again, massive plenia gatherers. The flower wasps are the winners though. This is the hairy-footed scoliad or flower wasp. They just go around and around those flowers like you can't believe. There's lots and lots of them out there and they just have these huge masses of plenty attached to their feet. Very pretty yellow and black wasp. Lots of pollinia. Another one again Lots of plenia hanging out here on this leg as well. You can really see them well. This is another scoliad, another flower wasp. It's called a scarab hunter. So it hunts for beetle larvae when it's not taking nectar and, and eating other things off of the flowers. Again, another really good collector of pollinia, a definite pollinator. Fun one to uh, photograph because it stands out with that bright orange color. You can see how they do, they have the plenia, how they do burrow. You can see how the, the dirt is trapped in the hairs of their legs as they go in and out of their burrow. This one is pretty amazing. It's got lots and lots of plenia and you know it's a, it's a pollinator of milkweed flowers. This is a different scolia. I don't know its name, but it's paired off here with an assassin bug. I think the assassin bug realizes it's a little bit outmatched if it wants this one for a meal. But again, you can see the pollinia attached to the feet. This is the Mexican scoliad wasp, Mexican flower wasp. And these are excellent gleaners through the flowers and it shows in the pollinia they pick up. This one was the winner of the Mexican scoliad wasp pickup. And this is my favorite, I call it the woolly, mantha, the woolly mammoth, but it's actually, um, Another scoliad flower wasp, it's called in the genus Xanthocampsomeris. It's a very long name for a very medium sized wasp, but very good at picking up pollinia. And these are always bent around the flowers, just, just grinding away, picking up nectar and whatever else they're finding. Um, and uh, excellent collectors of pollinia. And here's where like minds meet at the top of the clump and everybody's got pollinia. Okay, so kind of a little presentation on, um, on the, po the pollinators of 
milkweed that I that I saw and was able to document using photography. Now my plan at this point is if someone has a, a question they'd like to ask, want to pop on and do that, let's do it. But I would like to now follow up with sort of a biodiversity blast where I have images of of the various orders of insects that use these plant, these flowers um, and their predators and all that sort of thing. And I thought I would just show those until you all, your eyes roll back in your head and you all just passed out or you just said, I got to bail out of this. I can't take it anymore. Or the time runs out, whichever comes first. So anyone have a question they'd like to ask at this point? Just a real quick technical question. Can uh, Marglyph mute her phone please i don't know who marglyph is but she's not muted oh she keeps rustling around papers and stuff okay. thank you okay so let me see now if i can I roll in i think everybody likes butterflies don't they so let's show variety of butterflies. I have a question. How do you sure. spell, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how you're pronouncing the little uh, hair-like features on the legs. The hair-like features on the legs. Well, on the legs of the um, insects, there are hairs, really stiff hairs that are bristle-like, and then there are also spines on many of them. And then the, um, the pollen sacs that are attached are pollinia. And the little uh, threads that are attached to the pollinia are called um, translators. And then the, the head of the pollinia is a corpusculum. Okay, and what, when you were referring to the pollen that was being collected by a certain uh, part of the leg, mm -hmm. what was that? What was that called again? Well, those are pollinia, those are pollen sacs. Now, each one of those sacs contain about 100 to 200 grains of pollen. And I don't know who counted them, but I hope they did a good job. Um, and those are drawn out of the milkweed flower. And then uh, over the course of feeding, if they are deposited in a different flower, then they can go ahead and pollinate that flower in a fruit can form. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we're going to start with monarchs. We already saw this guy. Uh, monarchs are beautiful whether you whether you photograph the underwing or the or the uh, top wing. And what I like to try to do when I photograph is make sure that the antennae come out clear, the eyes come out clear, however much of the body is nice and clear, and usually the wings follow. But there's a lot of mass there, and it, it takes a bit of patience to get a good image. This is the, um, using a camera that has stabilizers in both the body and in the, um, in, in the lens. Uh, plants like this tend to sway back and forth in the wind and you, you pick up this insect when it hits about the, the middle of the lens. Um, but um, the camera like that, it's a mirrorless camera I was testing, really worked well in that aspect. Here's a male carpenter bee trying to figure out if there's any more food there after this monarch gets through. Late in the season after the milkweeds had had finished flowering all that was left were stands of aster and the late season uh, monarch migrants were using these stands of aster and they made for some gorgeous gorgeous photos. I told you about the place that had caterpillars, five caterpillars. This is what a monarch caterpillar looks like. They're pretty cute little guys. They just run around on the foliage and on the fruits and they eat as much as they can, get big and fat. And you can tell when they're ready to turn into a chrysalis and, and go hang on a cattail or some other structure because they start turning black colored, real dark. If you've got a monarch, you need a queen. This is a queen butterfly doing a little pose with the river in the background on whorled milkweed. And we have to get a under, under uh, a flower shot of one just to make sure we're keeping par with that monarch. 
Uh, queens are, are quite attractive brown butterfly. Again, the underwing is just as attractive as the, the uh, top wing shot on these. And the camera I was using had enough speed and enough balance that it could take a picture of a flying butterfly um, coming into a climbing milkweed flower where there was already a, a, a sitting feeding uh, queen butterfly. They make for a really, uh, when you crop the image down, they make for some really fantastic um, images that you could use for framing or that sort of thing. And when there's a bunch of them around, there's a migration going through right now, feeding on whorled milkweed. Um, and last year they were feeding on climbing milkweed. Uh, you'll always get twos and threes and fours. Now you're wondering why I'm putting this guy in with the queen. Well, one time I stopped because oftentimes I'll take a picture from about 10 feet away just to see for identification purposes. I don't really want to pursue that for a better picture. And I had a, a, a butterfly that I thought was a queen and it had landed on a, on a milkweed. And just as I was getting the focus down, getting ready to snap the shot, this little slender form come out of the grass underneath the stand of milkweed and grab that queen and splat it on the mud over on the, on the canal side. And a couple of days later, we had a, a morning rainstorm and this one was out warming up and I was able to get the uh, photograph of the culprit or its relative, uh, the southern leopard frog. One of those predators that are out there and leopard frogs will eat darn near anything that won't eat them. Um, okay, so if you have a monarch and a queen, you gotta have a viceroy. And um, interesting thing about a viceroy, uh, number one, the best time to take photos of a lot of butterflies is early in the morning when it's still cool because they like to open their wings all the way up to warm up. And uh, in this case, the viceroy posed with a, a green June beetle. Unfortunately, they're on a Russian thistle, but if nobody knows that it doesn't look all that bad. Um, but um, uh, one thing about the viceroy is that they are all over the milkweeds in terms of including it as part of their territory, but I've never seen one feed on a milkweed flower. I don't know why that is. Um, maybe they just don't like it, but they're definitely around. It's part of their territory and you're going to see them flying over these milkweeds when you're out. Again, beautiful underwing, and I think the underwing is just as beautiful as the top wing. Here's a pair, probably uh, kind of doing a bonding situation, uh, probably will mate later on, but feeding on salt cedar flowers or tamarisk flowers. Here's one posing against the river on three square bulrush. And I showed you this photo earlier. It just shows the busy nature, but also a variegated fritillary. And variegated fritillaries are also a flutterer when they feed, but every once in a while, they'll throw their wings completely open as they feed. Um, and it makes for some pretty nice uh, uh, visuals on the top wing. And the underwing is so different, you wouldn't even expect it to be the same butterfly. I'm always amazed by that, how that happens sometimes. Here's that wide open wing stance they sometimes do, even though they flutter a lot. So you can, if you're patient, you can catch a good photo of them. And of course we need a red admiral. Keep everybody safe. Unfortunately, I only saw one the whole season. He was feeding on his climbing milkweed. I was quite a distance away, so I didn't think I would get a good image. So this image of the top wing, this image of the bottom wing is all I have for red admirals. They're related to that group uh, in the same genus as painted ladies. Kind of a medium sized butterfly. And here's our painted lady sharing some space with a, with a wasp. And the underwing on these is so indescribably beautiful. It's, it's um, I actually kind of prefer the underwing shot to the top wing shot on these. And then of course, when you pair it together with the antenna and the eyes, uh, it really makes for a nice image. Um, they feed head down a lot. So a lot of times you see them on the clump, they're upside down. And they come out really early before all the other butterflies. And I think they do that. They can do that because of these hairs. I think those keep them warm enough that they don't, uh, they're not as, as affected by the cooler weather in the morning. So they come out a lot earlier to feed. 
medium-sized butterfly. I am assuming, even though I didn't catch any with pollinia on their feet, there are so many of them, I, I have to believe they, they're a potential pollinator. Every once in a while, though, they run into an issue. And sometimes they become food for critters like robber flies. It's a very large robber fly that said, painted lady, you're gonna be brunch. And so here we are in a, uh, it was feeding on, um, the painted lady was feeding on climbing milkweed and this big robber fly says, uh-uh, you're not gonna feed anymore, I am. And he took them all the way up into the, the upper portions to get away from my camera. Actually, it kept moving up as I kept snapping images. When I get a situation like this was kind of unique, I take many, many, many shots because you never know how many are gonna turn out. This guy is one of the fiercest feeders of painted ladies I've ever seen in my life. This roadrunner sitting out in the middle of the bike path, just watching those painted ladies ready to jump on him. Now I didn't get an image of this guy feeding, but at home a couple of years ago with a smaller camera, I had painted ladies on a butterfly bush and look at the intensity this roadrunner has on that painted lady. Then look at how much energy it's willing to expend for that meal. Here's its head, here's its tail, here's its wings. That much energy for it, uh, you know, nanograms of, of uh, protein. Here's a really odd butterfly. I actually saw that this spring. It's on a white sweet clover flower. It's called an American snout. I tossed it in just because it was right near uh, a stand of uh, climbing milkweed. This is the only one I've ever seen. And uh, so it's the only image I have, and it's uh, kind of a, a unique, uh, glad, I got the, glad I got the picture when I got it, because I may not see another one. This little guy or gal, don't know which, has green eyes, maybe a gal. Anyway, um, turned up all by its lonesome. It's called a fatal metal mark, and it was feeding on climbing milkweed flowers. Um, and of course, because it was all by its lonesome, had green eyes, and Actually, it's kind of pretty. I took several images of it, but you can see in its migration how beat up its wing tips are, and it's seen some action along the way as it's migrated. The only one I've, I've ever seen. Now, the most common butterfly along the whole river is one called the painted crescent. It's a very small butterfly. They love feeding on, on all things milkweed, climbing milkweed, world milkweed, as well as other flowers, and you're always going to see them out there and they always pose. You, here's the underwing shot, quite different, on a climbing milkweed. Now late in the season, climbing milkweed vines so much that they actually vine across the ground. And so this is a ground shot of a climbing milkweed. And painted crescents just love to pose, so you'll never get a bad shot. We'll talk about these later maybe. These are oleander aphids. They're feeding on the, the sap through phloem tubes. These often occur in pairs, sometimes in threes, fours, fives, and so you can really go crazy, and I guarantee you if you're out photographing butterflies, you're going to come back with a bunch of images of painted crescents. This is probably a different species, but I don't know who they are, but they look an awful lot like painted crescents, about the same size, so I'm assuming they're a crescent, but they may not be a painted one. It's the only shot I got all, all summer of a, a morning cloak. Very early in the season, it was feeding on actually salt cedar. I tossed it in just because it add, lends to the biodiversity that's out there and, and near these milkweed stands. The only image I have, only time I've seen, well, I've seen, seen them out there before. This is the only image I've ever been able to, uh, to uh, pick up. A group of dusky wings fly in and, and use climbing milkweed and world milkweed flowers. Uh, not very many of them, but they're, they're interesting in, in that they actually look a little bit more like a moth when you first see them. Here's one sharing some space with a, with a small bee. This one on world milkweed. And this one probably had a run in with a, with a bird somewhere along the way, got a chunk of its wing as it's migrating around. These butterflies don't necessarily have a relaxed life. Um, this is a, 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 we saw the underwing of this one as a potential pollinator, it's called a bordered patch. 
And this is when it opens those wings wide open. This is the uh, configuration you see and the colors. Sometimes they're a lot brighter though. Um, only saw maybe two or three of these during the whole season. So while they may be a potential pollinator under wing shot, they're, they're not common enough to be a very influential pollinator. Here's a little brighter colored top wing shot of a bordered patch. This is a swallowtail called a pipe vine swallowtail. And they do love to feed on, on um, milkweed flowers. They, like the black swallowtail, are flutter feeders. They just pump those wings up and down all the time. And all you do is shoot, 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 trying to time the underwing, trying to time the top wing. And you end up with 50 images to maybe get three or four or five good ones out of it that are nice and clear. But that's what you got to do to get an image. Here's a top wing, probably a female, feeding on world milkweed. Nice underwing, shows the body real well. The eyes are clean. Had at least one antenna. A top came in nice. This one feeding on a mat of climbing milkweed. It's hard to describe how pretty these are when they're in full flower. This one is really, really Piers Grabbit. I'm thinking that she's probably ready to lay eggs pretty quickly, but it got a little bit of the underwing, a little bit of the top wing, and that's always a good thing to do as well. This one's probably a male. You see a little bit of bluish sheen back here on the lower quarter of the wing, and that's pretty typical of males. This is a black swallowtail. You saw earlier that one had picked up several pollinia, maybe even this one. Uh, they're quite attractive. They have this nice powdery blue color in here. And last year they were really attracted to these climbing milkweed flowers and against the blue sky through the through the willow tops they just made very very great photographs uh, kind of frame worthy stuff I think in some of them and um, if you got the NMSU calendar this year if you look at July this is Miss July this female uh, black swallowtail graces the NMSU calendar that was uh, sold a while back Nice underwing, very complex underwing on, on this uh, uh, large butterfly. It's called an Arizona sister. And when you have different light uh, shine through them, you can really get different patterns and different views of the color patterns and, and the palette. So it's always good to try to get the light in your favor when you can. Um, beautiful, beautiful large butterfly, but I don't see many of these out there, maybe, maybe a handful and I never really saw them on, on the flowers of the milkweed, so I wouldn't count them in as a pollinator, even though they are quite large. Underwing of a common buckeye, probably named for something like that. They love feeding on climbing milkweed early. And these were very, very shy, and it wasn't until late season where I finally got a, a, a shot at the top wing, and you can see the little eyes here that are quite attractive. Uh, one problem with my mirrorless camera is if there's something bright and shiny closer to you, you're going to fade the thing you really want into the background. It can, can be a little bit frustrating. Sometimes that makes for a nice image. Again, an underwing shot late, late in the season. This is when the asters were blooming and the uh, milkweeds had stopped blooming. Uh, common, milk, common buckeye. And again, top wing with aster makes, makes I think this is a beautiful color combination. And again, kind of those frame-worthy shots that you get once in a while, if you're lucky. Tiniest butterfly out there, it's called the pygmy blue, western pygmy blue, and it's on Bermuda grass florets. That's the top wing. And here's the underwing, which I actually like the underwing pattern better than I do the top wing feeding on world milkweed. And here on climbing milkweed. Too tiny to be a pollinator, but sure pretty to look at. Gray hair streak. Hair streaks have this really weird um, appendage and they are constantly rubbing this part of their wings together. So they're sitting there on the flower and rubbing those parts together. And, um, you're hardly ever gonna see a top wing photo of these. Um, and it's almost always you're gonna get an underwing picture of, of hair streaks. Here's our, our friendly neighborhood great purple hair streak who's the potentially good pollinator, but again, only saw this individual. Thing about this one, very colorful on the underwing, but the top wing is all this 
luminescent blue color. And when it flies in the sun, it's so shiny. It's unbelievable, but it always keeps its wings folded up. I could never get a, a, a top wing shot. Here it's sharing space with the scolied flower wasp. This is the only one I saw. I mean, this is in the process of rubbing its wings together where these extensions come out. I do not know why they do that. Um, getting into the sulfurs, this one's called the sleepy orange. This is the only sleepy oranges I saw. They happen to be mating down in the Bermuda grass, and this was the best shot I could get uh, given the sun angle and all the reflection coming off of them. But at least I've got them documented. I know what they are now. Um, this little guy's called a dainty sulfur, very tiny, um, not even as, maybe as big as a dime. I had to get it as a composite over at Tortugas Peak in, in good profile. It does appear along the river, but very hard to photograph there, it's very shy. This is a common sulfur. This is the female and she's more whitish, but you can see some yellowish hairs in there feeding on uh, climbing milkweed. And here's the pair together, the male which is more orange, and the female, which is whitish. The orange sulfurs, really, really common out there. And uh, here, feeding on the last of the, of the milkweed flowers that are going to appear, and also some smartweed is flowering here. They're quite attractive, but when, another one of those species that never opens their wings up, so it's always, almost always going to be an underwing shot for you on orange sulfurs. And they're so common, you're gonna have a lot of images. Then you have a, a, quite a bit of uh, white butterfly use out there. This is a cabbage white, very early before the milkweeds flowered, feeding on salt cedar or tamarisk. Checkered white, feeding on a balia that had been introduced along, along the uh, 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 bike path. Another checkered white, although a different pattern of checkering, not as checkered, feeding on uh, skeleton weed. Okay, that was the butterflies. Let's see here. It's always interesting where to go. Now we've kind of seen the hymenopter. We saw a lot of bees and we saw a lot of um, wasps. I'm going to kind of skip that right now. And um, real interesting are the hemiptera, which are the true bugs that occur out there. And two of them in particular, one's called a small milkweed bug, the other one's called a large milkweed bug, um, are common. They are seed eaters, so they, they uh, use their stylet feeding apparatus and puncture the fruit wall and, and uh, feed on the seeds inside the fruit. Um, you can see a nice orange. They look an awful, awful lot like box elder bugs if you've ever seen those around your house. Just two spots back here is very indicative. Um, very interesting because there were two species, at least named species now, this one is uh, the genus Ligeus reclavitus, reclavitus, however they say that. Same thing here, and again, you see it feeding through a fruit, getting uh, its sustenance from the seed below. Same species, still reclavitus. This one actually has a seed alongside it. I thought that was kind of cool for a seed bug, a Ligeus. And they do like to hide when you take pictures, but if you notice, this one has a really broad gray patch across it, and that is the species Calmii. The other species has this really broad heart-shaped patch on its back. Now, about five years ago, a genetic study was done on these two species, and it was found that they were so close together, they were actually conspecific or the same species, but nobody had ever documented them in the field together in breeding. And so this last summer, I was able to um, take images of both Calmii and Reclivitus. Here's a pair of breeding that we can't tell which species they are from that. There. But this, um, this actually, this shot actually became an international shot. 
Um, this is Reclividus. This is Calmii. They're obviously breeding. Um, and this is the first time people had seen proof that these two interbred when they were in the same habitat. And a biologist from France who, who specializes in Ligeus made some really striking comments on high naturalists when I posted this one. Um, and uh, he works at a natural history museum in, in Nice. And we got to talking a little bit and he would like me, if possible this year, to try to capture some of these and raise them so that they can be uh, studied genetically in the future, uh, get some genetic material from them. So I'm kind of waffling a little bit if I want to do that, but oh, maybe there's somebody out there who'd want to volunteer to do something like that if these same two species appear together and uh, hopefully they do. The arlies have the two dots of white on the back and sometimes you see dots of white up here on the thorax. These are not genetic dots, these are parasite eggs. And so this is um, another species use of seed bug being parasitized by something. And this is the, the dude who lays them, or the, the young lady who lays them, a tachinid fly. A nasty, hairy thing, but they lay their eggs on the backs of bugs uh, and other insects that carry them around. This is a large milkweed bug, very colorful, very pretty. And you'll see lots and lots of them out there. I've already seen one so far, and there's fruits that are just forming. They have quite a color range. The older they get, they tend to fade a little bit. The younger they are, they're almost a bright red, younger, older, or mid-aged. And again, they, they feed through the fruit into the seed. Here's a pair breeding. And this one um, was the only couple of shots I got of one that appears to be a large milkweed bug, but it appears to not have all the pigmentation. Um, I don't have a clue what this is. Um, I was thinking maybe some kind of thrip, but I've never figured out what it is. So I'll have to try to do that someday. Um, but this is the best photo I got of it. And it appears in all aspects to be a large milkweed bug, but sans pigment. And a unique shot, the only one I saw, the only images I got from it. And I did post it on iNaturals just to let the, the experts play around with it if they, if they wanted to. Kind of weird, but awfully pretty. This is a nymph or a larvae of the large milkweed bug. It's kind of a late stage, almost ready to be an adult. And it's common to see the large milkweed bugs with the nymphs feeding on the fruits, on the seeds within the fruits, I should say. And you can't help but stop and take photos of them because they're just so darn pretty. And there's a lot of them and they're cute. This is on climbing milkweed. And so we have very tiny to a uh, little bit larger, almost ready to become adult nymphs. And then these silly thrips or flies or whatever they are. See how they kind of clump together on these fruits. And one night it got really cold, probably got down in the 40s. And I came out and saw all of this mass on one fruit. And the young ones, the, the smaller nymphs were underneath and the large ones were all over the top. Now my, my non-biological mind says, oh, well, maybe the adults are keeping the young ones warm as if they could actually think in that manner. Um, reality kind of sets in though and says probably, well, you know, the young ones kind of hang around in the same spot. These adults may have been out feeding somewhere else and then they just all came in together and made a little clump because it was a cold night. But uh, that's a little interesting discussion I'm having with the, the French biologist as well. And then we have the most common bug out there. These are oleander aphids and they're nasty looking bright yellow thing with, all, with these little spines on them. And the only thing I've seen that kind of eats up on them is this cute little larvae right here, which is a larvae of a lady beetle. Here's an even smaller one. And they go through and, and eat detritus, but also I think they pick off a few of these uh, oleander aphids. 
they're exceptionally hard to photograph just because of their, their color, the way they lay in, and uh, trying to get a pretty good image is tough. But, you know, you get the idea. These, these start early, they stay late, and they're on every stem, every flower, every fruit uh, out there, and uh, just a, a common uh, aphid and the most common bug. Assassin bug. This is called a leafhopper assassin bug and also the sticky foot bug because, or sticky leg bug because this area on the legs has a um, kind of a glue-like substance and when it wraps up an insect between those legs, the insect can't get away and then it can go ahead and feed on its, its inner juices, its life force. And then late in the season, this rough stink bug showed up and was feeding around on, on uh, old um, milkweed follicles. And normally they feed on leaves and, and stems of trees. And so I think it was just resting during migration and found a place that was warm, but interesting to see and you know, appear on a milkweed. And one water bug, this is the, the giant water bug I'm not really that familiar with its biology and that sort of thing. Interesting to see it is in, in the outfall water. And I'm really interested in learning more about its mode of, of propulsion because you see this expanded area behind it. And you just wonder how in the heck it's doing all that. Okay. The dipterans are kind, actually I should stay in there. Those dipterans are, have some um, interesting elements. The flies, wake up, there we go. An interesting coloration to work on when you're taking photographs. This is a metallic green long-legged fly and it's just foraging on, on a climbing milkweed leaf, kind of a bronze color. This is a green bot fly and it's, it's uh, reflects well and has both bronze and green. The tachinid fly we saw earlier laying eggs all on the other bugs and they're fairly common out there. They also forage on, on the flowers and the milkweeds. Another type of tachinid fly, genus Allogropta. And a bee fly with very, very uh, striking bee fly, but I have no clue what its name is. No one has uh, responded to me yet. Yellow shouldered drone fly foraging on the milkweed. And then there are a lot of the bee flies that are uh, in this villa genus or exoprosopa genus. And they feed on uh, constantly on milkweed flowers, not pollinators. This one was on a balia that was uh, near the milkweeds. Very attractive and, and uh, very easy to take photos of because they pose really well. This was an anthracene bee fly, unknown bee fly here. Bee fly sharing space with a wasp. This is the Lordotus bee fly, and it's uh, in that late season when the asters were flowering again. Makes for a nice, uh, pleasant image, especially with the one flower and the fruit. More unknown bee flies. There's all kinds of bee flies out there and they're fun to take photos of. Even this is a, a, a fly, it's called a club Midas fly. Just a weird looking little guy is hanging on to world milkweed. And I don't know much about them at all. This is called a thick headed fly. Kind of has a, a wasp mimic, mimic uh, feel to it. And uh, that was just so weird. I, I really had to post that on iNaturalist to, to figure out more about, uh, more about it. This is called a four speckled hoverfly. And uh, very attractive. And when you can get them to pose, they can take some really, really nice photos. They're very tiny, but very striking in terms of their coloration. And I even caught a pair procreating to the next generation on a old, um, uh, uh, sweet clover stem. But they can also end up becoming a burrito for 
the western or western spotted orb weaver, another of the uh, uh, predators that occur out there. And these orb weavers will lay their webs between plants of milkweed or over the tops of milkweeds, and they're very efficient once they once they capture something. They're right out there. A um, little bit about that camera with the stabilizers. This web was bouncing up and down almost constantly in the wind and I was able to capture these uh, visuals, even though it was in motion most of the time. Very pretty little uh, fly called, a, a hover fly called an exotic stripe tail. Very tiny. And it's hovers. Here we have a robber fly. It's in the group called hanging thieves, along with a wasp. Here it is on a three square bull rust, just resting. And here it's playing kind of, uh, you know, hide and seek with the one below it. Actually they're breeding. And I, I was, found it so amusing that it had its feet right down on the other one's eyes <laughs> during that process. Uh, this one I thought was a stand up comedian had, and it was so bad that it actually laid an egg. And this one, it is a little predator. You might have seen it on the blurb that John sent out. And this is a, a case of a rubber fly, a predator, eating a damselfly, another predator. So you have predator on predator, a higher order of predator, since the damselfly is the one being ingested. And here's one that's captured a bee fly. And here's an odd looking one that I actually was able to find a genus for that I can't really pronounce well, so I won't, but another robber fly. And um, this is a cute little guy, looks a lot like a bubble bee, right? Really big eyes like a koala bear. But it's called, of all things, the bee killer robber fly because it forages exclusively, or maybe not exclusively, but from what I saw, honeybees. And here's one that's captured a honeybee. It's starting to ingest it. And in this case, there's uh, some pollen, other food on the honeybee's leg. And here we have a smaller fly coming in to forage on, on that three square bulrush horsetail. And if you can get these to pose, if you actually see them, not necessarily even with a bee, they're, they're in their own way, they're really cute, even though they're pretty darn vicious. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and treat you to a few, everybody likes to see things like um, dragonflies so, and they're predators over all of the flowers. But one thing that was really interesting out there is that there are red swamp prey fish and when it rains really heavily, they'll come out on the bike path. And the, I just like this one because it's so defiant. Poor, Poor little crayfish had lost both of its claws in some battle or something along the way, but still standing there in so much defiance. I just, uh, I just like that one. And uh, this is what they look like when they're whole and crossing the bike path. Uh, they, when it rains real heavily, they'll come out of their burrow and go to the river and uh, presumably reproduce there. In the process, so they do eat up some insect eggs and larvae uh, as part of their the food they feed on. Take a little look at the dragonflies because I don't know who doesn't like dragonflies. We'll start with bandwing meadowhawks. Very, very pretty. They pose very well. If you get the right sun angle, you can really get great shots of them. These are all bandwings, different sexes, different ages. Variegated meadowhawk. This is the most common dragonfly out there. Like I said, it's there from April till, till December. Essentially, in here, they, a couple is, uh, is mating and uh, laying eggs for the, the next generation. And they perch really well. One thing about them, this is the one that's on three square bulrush, but these veins all shine copper. 
if you get the right kind of sun. So if you can get them in the right kind of sun, here it's the leading edge, this is the female, perched and ready to catch something to eat. Here's one that shows this copper color that they can create if you have the right sun angle. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous photo if you can uh, get them in the right light. Variegated meadowhawk, female on a milkweed fruit. And here's a, a male sharing space with a ruby spotted uh, damselfly. An unknown meadowhawk. And this is the western pond hawk that has captured a tachinid fly for its meal on a cattail leaf. And a little bit of a close-up showing the fly wings and how it's kind of using its front leg to stuff it in. Sort of like a hot dog eating contest. It's the only image I was able to get of a white belted ringtail, so I was really happy to get a pretty good one. And these all forage over the milkweeds. They, they eat a lot of the, um, the milkweed foragers, not necessarily the pollinators. The pollinator might be a little bit too big and nasty. This is a brimstone club tail. I only saw a couple of them during the course of this. Very attractive dragonfly. Russet tip club tail, the most common club tail out there. And they use milkweed heads for, for uh, perches to, to go ahead and go after the various other insects around that they like to eat. And they hang their, they hang their abdomen down when they perch. So a little bit different photo opportunity for you. Actually, it makes it a little bit easier in a lot of cases to take a good image. The blue-eyed darner also hangs straight down. Very large dragonfly, very attractive dragonfly. This one was hanging from a salt cedar. And really old, really beat up. If it could tell you about the battles it's been through, this is very late in the season. But I'd like to show that, just to show you uh, how much they put up with just to try to reproduce. This is the largest dragonfly out there. It's called a common green darner. You can never get one on a perch in a shrub, but this one happened to be sitting, warming up a little bit on the concrete in La Llorona Park. So I was able to get a, a full body image and a little bit of a close up. So um, good to get a, a photograph of that species. And here they are, a pair breeding. Uh, again, the idea to lay eggs and have another generation. Eastern amber wing, these, these are just outrageously bright and beautiful, tiny little things about as tiny as you can get as a dragonfly. Uh, that was a male, this is a female. And they really reflect this golden, uh, dark, deep dark yellow uh, color. They're, they're hard to describe if you've not seen one. And they really set up to, to go out and catch them some, a meal, a male, another female. And I like this one in the full light. It just set up really nicely. Didn't get the face first shot, but I'll take that one any day. This is probably the most common dragonfly out there, um, of the smaller dragonflies, I should say. Uh, it's called a blue dasher. And you'll see them in all kinds of poses here on Rumex, getting ready to, to catch those insects and just stuff them in their mouths. And they pose really well. They're, they're not really shy, so you can get lots of images of them. And uh, you feel compelled because they have so many looks to take lots of images. Here they are breeding and, again, going after that next generation. Love to look at the eyes close up and see all the cells in them, the reflection of the sun. This guy likes to eat them. This is a... A uh, wolf spider that was hanging out on a Rumex right next to this orb weaver. And uh, it was ready to capture a, uh, a blue dasher if it could get one near. There were a lot of blue dashers around. It was really intent looking at them. And every once in a while, you see something like this go on. This is called a dragonlet, and I don't know which species it is. It's the only time I saw it. The only, only got a couple of shots of it. This is called a plateau dragonlet, a lot like the uh, 
the uh, blue dasher, but much, much darker in the front and in the body. Beautiful skimmer. Skimmers are very beautiful. They're very large. This is a roseate. Another roseate skimmer. This one's called black saddlebags because of this dark coloration back here, the only image I got last year. And this one's called the 12 spotted, sitting on some Rumex. It foraged over a lot of um, the world milkweed stands. And it's one of those that's impossible to take a bad image of uh, as long as you're in a spot where you're not gonna scare it away. Flame skimmer, they're just so attractive and, and, and so bright. If, if you get the right sunlight, you can do all sorts of things with them. Um, and they perch really well. They're, they're kind of in between in terms of their shyness, but you can get good shots of them if you're patient, in all different angles. This one I like because it was um, out on this stem and it was sharing its perch. Oops, did we miss it? No, next one. This one's great coloration with the uh, sun at a different angle. But the earlier one was sharing its stem with an orb weaver, spider, trying to catch things. And here the fire ant moving up the stem towards it. So you have three, well, the fire ant's a little bit of a forager, but it will, it will also uh, could be classified as a predator. So you have three predators all in the same spot. So it must be a good spot. And this is called a widow skimmer. I've only seen a couple of them in one spot. So they're pretty rare and they're very shy. So that's the best shot I'll probably ever get of them. Anybody still out there? Yep. All right, are you still awake? <laughs> Indeed I am, I'm loving this. Okay, well you're gonna get some more of it having said that. Okay, we're going to move into the uh, neuropterans, the lace wings. Love it all. All right. This is an antlion adult, and it's the one that occurs out there in the, um, in, in the uh, Bermuda grass next to the, or actually underneath, uh, milkweed stands. And there are plenty of ants for its little babies to catch. Um, and uh, but the to get a picture of the adult, very colorful adult like this is is hard to do. They're very hard to get into focus because they have their wings all spread out and their body and their antennae and everything. So you just have to keep shooting away till you get something that is at least acceptable for identification. This is probably the best shot I got. And um, when you get them up close, zero in on that uh, face. They're just really cute even though their their little babies are are very vicious when they talk when it comes to trapping ants and munching them down. Then we have the green lacewing. This is actually a very nice insect. It eats a lot of the leaf hoppers and, and things like that. And they're hard to shoot because they're so uh, translucent. You see the body through the wings, extremely long antennae. So if you want to get the whole bug, you got to really kind of lay back a little bit and uh, they're almost always under a leaf or in shade and so in that regard they blend in so well with the vegetation. I like this shot because they've got a little bit of sunlight to come through. At least the head portion, the front portion is pretty nice but again uh, uh, very beautiful but, but tough to get images of. Okay, I can't let the damselflies go by because my favorite buddy of the whole session was a damselfly. And there are a variety of damselflies that feed around and on these um, milkweed plants and flowers and other vegetation. This is a powdered dancer. It's a species that is that feeds really low just above the um, Bermuda grass typically. Here it's actually perched on a milkweed stem or leaf. And powdered dancer is characterized by this light blue color. And then the, um, uh, the powdery look of its uh, abdomen. Although that's not always a good indicator because sometimes the powder wears off and it becomes a non-powdery dancer. But they're really gorgeous. 
and they'll they will pose for you quite a bit and you get all ages this is a a young female and when you get the young ones involved it's almost impossible to tell what they are anyway so you take photos and you say okay somebody who knows a whole lot more about these than i do needs to identify them nice little close-up big gray eyes And a baby. This one's just getting started and really, really has a lot of the powdery uh, material spackled on him. This is called a blue fronted dancer because the whole face is blue and they have blue eyes. This is a uh, female, young female, so it doesn't quite have any other colors associated with it yet. And this is a pair of blue fronted dancers mating. Now with the um, damselflies, it's, uh, the female will attach to the male up here so they, they're popular for forming this heart shape uh, when, when they're breeding and the male deposits a sperm packet on the female and then she uses that later on to lay eggs. Uh, with damselflies though, there's almost always another male around and that other male will also try to read with this female. And if it, it, it's possible after this one left, it will take the pollen packet from her and then deposit its own pollen packet. So I'm thinking we should call this female Cecilia for an old Simon and Garfunkel tune, perhaps. But uh, quite attractive damselfly. All the damselflies are very attractive when they get their mature state, and very colorful, very fun to watch. This one is sitting, uh, setting its perch up on a, a seed or a fruit of a climbing milkweed. And a baby. This is a Paiute dancer, the only one I saw, the only image I have of it. So not spectacular, but unique. This is called a river bluette. And this is the familiar bluette. This is the most, one of the most common damselflies you'll see, especially if you're in an aquatic situation. They have this black band across. Another blue-eyed, blue-fronted one. This black band is pretty obvious. And here they are coming together in a breeding situation. The female will attach here and then it'll form this heart uh, shape, which uh, a lot of people like to capture, uh, but it's not uncommon to see them breeding stay with the female depositing uh, depositing eggs along the way. Females um, only live about a month. Actually, both of them only live about a month or a month, month and a couple of weeks, and their whole goal in life is to eat and breed as many times as possible. That's their whole life's story as an adult. Here's a pair doing uh, kind of a configuration on a stick that I thought was kind of cool, a little bit of a figure eight. And I think I told Gordon that this is how they score the number 10 when they're judging things. So we have the, the male in weight, we have the male that's copulating and leaving a pollen or a uh, sperm sac, and we have a complete connection. So we have the typical heart shaped configuration. And then this guy is just waiting to be the next one in line. Another Cecilia here. But this is my favorite, all time favorite. It's called the American Ruby Spot Damselfly. And if you can't, don't like this one, I don't think you could ever like any damselfly. They pose so well, they pose in so many manners that are just really cool here on the, the fruits of, uh, of world milkweed. And uh, when they're in mating condition here, we see a male and a female trying to figure out, okay, are we gonna get together or not? Um, I really like this one. I, I call this one divergent paths. I think this is past palum, the grass, and, and they're, they're uh, each perched perfectly on, on that to make a nice pair of male and female. This one I call a bridge too far. It reminds me of the bridge in St. Louis, the, the arch. Really interesting, you can get them paired together and um, 
in the right light. Uh, I just can't think of a, a much thing, many things that are much prettier. So you're going to see an awful lot of images real quick here. This one's on three square bulrush. Here's one perched hunting on world milkweed. This one is on an old uh, fruit, milkweed fruit. This one is just pretty. Here you can really see the ruby spot well in this, in this particular light. And I have one where one is landing and, and again, you can see how bright that, that patch really is. This is on world milkweed perch. Here's late in the season. You can tell we already have some seeds being produced. And they do hunt over these milkweeds and they take some of the, the uh, critters that would normally come in and, and uh, feed on the pollen. Here's one with wings open, just landing after going after a fly. You can see how bright that, that ruby spot really is. Here's one sharing space with a variegated meadow hawk, dragonfly on barnyard grass. That makes for a nice little arrangement as well. And this one is either, I, I think it's admiring the catch of this orb weaver spider. I counted, I think 21 of these small flies and midges that it had captured. And I think this damselfly is just saying, wow, you are one fisher, I mean, one, one natterman. And also I think though it might be going in and stealing them and eating them itself. I, I wouldn't put it above any of these predators to do that. Here's one that's perched suspiciously close to a bunch of insects eggs that are on these filaments. I uh, don't know exactly which insect laid those, but it's on a whorled milkweed leaf. And it may be feeding on them, but I can't prove that. Um, here's one that just caught a small fly and is starting to ingest it. And this one I call white fang because it obviously caught something that had either some really long antennae or had really long um, uh, projections on, its, on the end of its abdomen. But it's really funny to see it's got most of it gobbled down except for these long extensions. This was the first one I ever saw perched, the first ruby spot I ever saw perched on a milkweed plant. And it was really awkwardly perched uh, because normally they're up on top with their tail up in the air. And this one was uh, kind of on the side, almost hanging there. And as I cropped this image, I noticed this little spine right here, this little green spine. And lo and behold, it had become prey to this green crab spider that's essentially the same color as the milkweed. Absolutely no difference. between. So here we have an instance of a predator being taken by a predator on a milkweed plant. So sometimes you come up with really cool stuff and you don't even, had I not taken this image, I would have never known what was going on there. So you got to just keep snapping away. Here's a case of another robber fly that found an American ruby spot damselfly and ingesting it, another case of predator on predator. Okay, I think we beat that group to death. I'm gonna show you this group just because they're weird. Um, starting with the homoptera is an easy group because there's only a few. Here we have a blue leaf hopper, the only one I saw, the only image I got of it, and it's with an oleander aphid here. That's a pretty little thing, and, and I'm glad I was able to capture it. A teeny tiny thing called a three cornered alfalfa tree hopper. All of those words for this tiny thing, I have it on my bike glove because it's so small and hard to contrast. And here it is on a leaf of a coral milkweed. But they too can meet their demise if you have a hungry American ruby spot damselfly and here's one getting his green stuff for lunch. So the damselflies always say eat something green every day.
take a quick run through the orthopterans. All the birds out there that have babies in the nest are looking for orthopterans. This is the only shot I got of a Katie did that was on a fruit of a world milkweed. One thing that I noticed about, the, well, Katie dids are first of all, are very, it's called a bush Katie did, fork-tailed bush Katie did. They're very hard to photograph in their entirety because they're extremely long antenna, and really long legs. This one came out reasonably well. Uh, one of the things I noticed with this one though, is that there were scrape marks below it on this milkweed follicle and fresh latex, fresh uh, sap coming out of it. And I'm compelled to believe that perhaps this Katie did was uh, chewing on it uh, or, or scraping on it trying to, for some reason, maybe to get forage, maybe for some other reason. But I, can't, I could, couldn't prove that from that image, but it's intriguing. A little bit of a close-up showing those beautiful eyes. Yeah, a little bit evil, but um, you can really get a little more detail in at least the base of the antenna with a close-up like that in the venation. And how remarkably similar in color it is to the plant host. This guy is, or gal or whoever is about three and a half inches long. It's called a gray bird grasshopper. And there's a few of them around. They hang out in the salt cedars and other high perches. And they're a favorite of uh, kestrels, the little falcons that fly around. They love to get these big grasshoppers and eat them up. And hiding in the world milkweed usually are a group of grasshoppers called slant-faced grasshoppers. And they're kind of colorful and uh, you'll see them around and every once in a while you might be able to take a decent picture of one. But usually they're, they're pretty hidden in the foliage. Here's a different species of slant face hiding down in the Bermuda grass. Uh, but I don't really know the species of them other than the common name. This is called a differential grasshopper. Here we have a pair, one that's more yellow, one that's more green. I don't know if that's an age thing or if it's a thing that allows them to be more competitive and live longer uh, because of coloration. I'm not real sure about that, but they're in a cattail stand right next to the uh, milkweeds. This one's feeding on and, and hiding in Russian thistle. These are a common target of every bird that has babies in the nest. They go after these like, like they're jelly beans to a kid. They can be kind of attractive uh, or at least interesting to look at if you get close enough to them. This one is on climbing milkweed leaves. And they have the, again, those beautiful blue eyes, bicolored antennae, who can, uh, who can walk away from something like that. And I guess they're pretty tasty. Well, there's got to be a lot of protein. They're pretty big. They're an inch and a half long at least. And they're very big, so there's got to be a lot of protein for those little birds. And we have our, our uh, Arizona or bordered mantis and uh, praying mantis, most people call them. And I can't get over their facial look. And when you're taking pictures of them, taking images and looking at them closely, they follow you with their face the whole time. One thing I didn't know about them is around the lip area, they have this blue band and yellowy band. Uh, that's part of their lip. It's interesting to see their, their uh, front uh, forelegs folded back in the way. And they, again, extremely long antenna, extremely long legs and appendages, extremely large body. And they're the same color as the host plant, in this case, world milkweed. They're tough to get a good image of the whole thing. So I like to focus on the face. And it reminds me of that Kim Carnes song, Betty Davis Eyes. You know, she's got Betty Davis Eyes. Uh, and uh, so I always uh, come up with little uh, comparisons like that, remembrances, so that I can remember what the heck they are. This one was really lucky. It happened to catch a weevil wasp for lunch. I have a few images up because this is such an unusual thing for me to see. You can see how it's holding the weevil wasp right behind its head and its thorax. The weevil wasp was feeding on this, this uh, world milkweed and maybe even trying to pollinate. And this uh, mantis just said, no, -uh, you're grunge. And notice every time I take a photo, it's looking right at me, keeping right up with me. You almost feel sorry for the weevil wasp because you know where it's going. But like every, everything and everybody, these mantises like wings. And here we got a whole mouthful of, of uh, weevil wasp wing. And I don't know if there's any barbecue sauce on it, but I bet you'd love it more if it had it. 
Another thing I didn't know about them is it had this uh, dark band at the base of its neck. So there's just things you see when you just keep snapping images like crazy. Eventually you're gonna get something that's either unique or, or e even actually good. The other thing I was amazed about about Manus is here late in the fall, this is a, a female that's obviously ready to, to lay eggs pretty soon, but how the color variation, how the color changed to match that of the foliage. In this case, sandbar willow foliage that's turning. And uh, the only reason I could see that from the bike path is, is I saw just a shape that seemed out of place on the willow. So I stopped, went back and took a look at it, and here it is, this big mantis. And this is actually not a bad photo. I actually got most, I got pretty good shot of that antenna right there and most of the body in pretty good shape. So sometimes you get lucky when you're taking images. A little bit of more of a crop down close up. And again, keeping those eyes right on me. And the impossible one to photograph for me is the walking stick. Uh, this is called a prairie walking stick. You can barely see it amongst the, uh, here's its body amongst those uh, willow leaves. By colored, so they're quite attractive with the green abdomen and, and kind of a straw colored. And then the legs too are bicolored, colored, so it's pretty interesting. Extremely, extremely long antenna, extremely, extremely long body, extremely long legs. So you try to get all that into focus and you've done something. This one is walking around on a willow above a climbing milkweed patch. This is the best shot I got, I think, overall. Um, and I'm pretty proud of this shot, so, so I like it a lot. Antenna aren't really in focus, so the leg isn't really in focus with the rest of it's not too bad. Uh, I'll take it. Um, but this is the, this is the, um, probably the strongest or the most determined man to, or uh, walking stick I found along the way. We had a really violent wind the night before, it was probably blowing 40 miles an hour and blow, blowing all this vegetation around. And this poor walking stick lost its two middle legs and lost one of its front legs. And it was still climbing up this uh, climbing milkweed plant. And it was heading up towards this flower. And I have to give it all the cred in the world. You talk about a wounded warrior. This is one right here. Again, just odd little things you see when you're out getting off the bike path and, and walking two steps or three steps over. Well, we might as well stay there if everybody's still awake. And uh, Zoom hasn't kicked me off. The beetles can be pretty interesting as well, coleopterans. There's one called a bright yellow blister beetle that feeds on the nectar. Not a pollinator, but when you see it, you can't miss it because it is bright. Almost a unicolor except for its eyes. You can tell it's a blister beetle because of this exposure of the abdomen at the end. <clears throat> For some reason, this one is really um, a dull color of yellow, <clears throat> and it may be getting ready to mulch or something, I don't know, or uh, some other thing going on with it. But this is typically how they are, and uh, really beautiful yellow, if you like yellow. Now we have a really nice mat of climbing milkweed flowers, and the green June or fig beetles, very large beetles, are foraging. Um, through these flowers looking for nectar and in the process probably pollinating a few of them. Here they are on salt cedar or tamarisk flowers, metallic, so they're very, very shiny. If you can get the right sun on them, very showy. Here we have a pair <clears throat> that's mating and uh, one that maybe wants to join in, but we have three on a willow stem, unusual. Very bright underneath too, a, a very, uh, metallic brown or bronze color. This one's foraging on Russian thistle and a really good light on it so you can see the reflection of the green metallic. I actually like that photo the best I think of all of my um, green June beetle photos. This one foraging and, and you can see this brown edge around the, uh, the more metallic green. These are pretty compact, but because of their size, again, it's often tough to bring them all into focus at once. And I really like this photo with the flower in focus and the, and the beetle itself. And this one is not too bad on a whorled milkweed, just a feeding away. These are only around for about a month or a month and a half. And so 
while they pick up a lot of pollinia, they're probably good pollinators. They're not through the whole flowering season. They're not there through the whole flowering season. And one surprise, late in the autumn, I looked up in the willows above a patch of, of climbing milkweed and this three and a half inch guy was looking down at me. And um, you know, it doesn't really scare you, but it gives you a little start when you see something like that, it's about a foot or a foot and a half above your head because you just don't expect it. And it's, it's so different, but then uh, because it saw me looking at it, it dropped down into the climbing willow patch or the climbing <laughs> milkweed patch, excuse me. A little out of shape here, and uh, very. Uh, it, its name is pretty apt: a metallic wood boring beetle. And uh, here it is uh, with with its metallic, uh, kind of a blue, almost iridescent blue and yellow spots. Many many yellow spots. You see the blue more on the legs, but that's the blue that's here as well. It's just that the sun is a little too direct. Even the antenna are that sort of metallic blue, but really pretty, really huge. And a total surprise, the only time I saw one. These guys showed up this spring. They weren't there last year, but I decided to toss them in because they're so unique. They're called tiger beetles. And these are called oscillated tiger beetles. And they're considered to be one of the fastest insects on earth, if not the fastest. They run like the wind, actually faster than the wind, and they fly just as fast. And they have these, they're a predator, they have these really nasty curved uh, mandibles sticking out in front of them. And they're, uh, they're fun as can be to, to photograph because they're tiny and they're really cute in, a, in their own way. And they have lots of features, lots of hairs uh, all over that you can pick up. Uh, the spots on the metallic, kind of metallic greenish background. You get threesomes. Awful lot of them are breeding, so you see an awful lot of couples out there trying to make that new generation happen. Okay, different beetle coming up, and this is its baby. Very cute little baby, a nice little larvae messing around amongst all of the oleander aphids and kind of feeding away on this little fruit. <coughs> and here it is, a little bit different view. Pretty baby. Now who in the world would leave a pretty baby like that all alone? What could they possibly be doing? Uh, to not protect that, that, that little baby. And, uh, oh, okay, they got something else on their mind. What's unique about this lady beetle is, it's aptly named, it's called a convergent lady beetle. So they're, they, they're converging while they're little babies. Here's another little baby are, are out foraging among the oleander aphids. Lady beetles are hard to, to uh, photograph because they're very shy. They always move away into the shade. And when you get too close and they just drop off the plane into the grass below. And what's really, really hard to photograph is them with the thorax and the head all the way exerted from the, from the uh, uh, elytra or the wings. And so uh, that's my best ladybird shot or lady beetle, used to call ladybird beetles, but to lady beetle shot, uh, this convergent lady beetle. This one is feeding amongst on the fruits, amongst all these oleander aphids. Makes for a contrast, but also a contrast in size if you know how big a lady beetle is and you know how small these aphids are. And there's, this one has a really unique name. It's called the spotless lady beetle. And uh, I think that's about the most appropriately named beetle I have ever seen. And then this is an odd beetle called a wedge-shaped beetle. I only have this image of it. It has really cool combed antennae, but um, I'm gonna have to look harder for it this year if there's any around. Flowers are not in very good condition this year because of the drought. This is an unknown gray beetle that showed up late after all the flowering, and it's just foraging on the old uh, milkweed stems. Uh, I don't know what, what it's expelling here, all this fluid, um, if that's a normal thing or if it was frightened by me taking pictures or something like that. Um, but just foraging along on, on uh, the old milkweed pots and picking up a little bit of food, I assume. It just showed up late in the season and there it is. And I took pictures, it was also on Sphorelsia, the, not the uh, cotton mallow or the mallow plant. And one day, 
two species of longhorn beetle showed up. This is on Johnson grass. They would stand or be on this Johnson grass, attracting a mate, and then they would drop into the milkweed plants below in order to mate or to hide because I was there. And this one is called a double banded bison. And this is a mating pair of longhorn beetles, um, amazingly long antennae that are nearly impossible to get in a shot. This one is on Sphoralsia, but they drop down when they're frightened into the milkweeds below. Um, and only saw them one day, one stop, and that's the only images I have of them. Um, darkling beetles, they eat detritus, they eat all the stuff that falls to the ground. And there's four or five species I saw <clears throat> along the way, and uh, especially late in the season, they're crossing the bike path like crazy. They actually become targets for some bikers, unfortunately. But uh, this is a little round pill-shaped one. A little more elongate one. And it has its own parasite on it. I don't know who put the brown parasite on. These are also, also called darkling beetles. Darkling beetles, uh, coleoptera, feed in detritus. Here's one with a very nice wing shape. Since I'm on my bike, almost all the shots are straight down, so I should probably get off the bike once in a while. This was the latest one I saw probably out in December. It was crossing over the path, uh, going in under the, under the grasses and milkweeds to eat the detritus. And this one I just saw a couple of days ago, and it's a brown dung beetle, one of the scarab beetles, and a very pretty brown color. Don't know much about it. First time I saw one, and uh, just happened to be out there, so I took a photo of it as I was, I was passing along. Another one of those things you see. Oh boy, we've kind of gone through them. I could go through the Hymenoptera, but you know, bees and wasps, we've already seen most of them as pollinators. Um, what I'd like to do is there's a lot of vertebrates out there that, um, that forage on these insects and their eggs and their larvae. Um, and so I wanted to throw in some of the vertebrates. We have uh, shider minnows that forage on semi-aquatic aquatic plant or uh, species of, of bugs and insects and their eggs and things. Um, and they're all through the, the water that occurs there right next to where everybody lays their eggs, all the damselflies, everything else lays their eggs. Uh, frogs and toads. Um, I think this is probably some kind of frog. It's actually got its eye on the shiner minnow, so it can be a predator of those as well as the insects or arthropods. Carp, they're just around slurping up everything they can. Um, it's really odd to be out there when there are a bunch of them feeding. You hear all these slurps happening on the water. You almost think you're in a 7-Eleven at the slurping machine. Um, here's a little bluette. Taking out that, checking out that carp says, you're not going to get me. Uh, when coming to the surface, taking in water through its gills, trying to slurp in as much protein as it can get its uh, lips around. But even carps have their predators. Here is a great blue heron. Now, this is a little bit of a cheap photo because I took this picture at Bosque del Apache in December. But I didn't realize that great blue herons would take a fish, a carp this big. Um, and there are definitely great blue herons around. Um, around the uh, bike path canal and I see them quite often and so even the carp have a predator that is large enough to take them out of the water. Bullfrogs, bullfrogs will eat anything that won't eat them. They're sort of the roadrunner of the aquatic world. Um, and an interesting thing I saw late in the season, this one was getting ready to hibernate, had already dug into the mud once and it was collecting these big balls of, of air that it was, I assume, swallowing or somehow keeping in its mouth, probably to take oxygen out as it hibernated under the mud. And uh, that just fascinated me. I'd never seen that before. Of course, our southern leopard frog, who I told you about before, I just think he showed real nicely in a photo, so I had to include him again. And, and these, these are pretty uh, voracious predators as well. They'll take in most anything they can get their lips around to, their mouths across including some of the um, 
uh, more defensive uh, insects like wasps and bees if they can handle them. A cute little toad, tiny little thing called a red spotted toad. And uh, it feeds again in the aquatic environment. And you see it on the bike path when they're, after they um, leave the tadpole stage and they're hopping out to find different habitat, uh, they show up on the bike path early in the season, early in the flowering season. And we have a big old woodhouses toad, and there are probably other toads out there as well. And these guys hop across the bike path and go into these habitats and, and eat a lot of arthropods, insects as well. This one may actually be ready to, to uh, lay eggs. Looks pretty large. Uh, the turtles um, feed on the fish. They feed on arthropods if they can get them. Uh, they feed on almost anything. Again, they can get their lips around. Um, these are spiny soft shell turtles. A lot of them out there, they like to slide out of the mud bars. From the bike path, they can literally see you and are so shy they'll go back in the water when you're 100, 150 feet away. Very difficult to get images of these guys. Here's another soft shell. This is called a red-eared slider. It's out getting some sun, but it, they feed pretty voraciously on the fish. And, frogs and everything else, uh, uh, and including arthropods. This is a western pond turtle going across some dry ground uh, from areas of water to area of water. And again, they're, they're like that red-eared slider. They'll feed on lots of different things, including some uh, of the smaller vertebrates. And they come up under the trees and under the shrubs and into the milkweed stands, and they lay their eggs. And these eggs tend to hatch about April unless some other vertebrate comes in and digs them out and eats them all up. So these are turtle eggs that were laid in this hole. Somebody dug them out. Don't have a clue who. I have seen gray fox in here digging. I have seen um, tracks of coyotes, um, seen tracks of javelina. And then there are pocket gophers and uh, probably a ground or a rock squirrel maybe in there. So hard to say what dug that up, but you can see how some of the eggs are dug up and end up being food in and of themselves without ever hatching. A lot of snakes uh, go in across the path and go into the uh, milkweed stands and up along the river. This is a checkered garter snake. I have also see the, seen the traditional garter snake, but couldn't get an image. And these are quite attractive little snakes. A lot of what I call bull snakes from where I grew up, I think you would call them gopher snakes here. And the 90% of the snakes you're gonna see on the past sunning and that sort of thing are gonna be these uh, gopher or bull snakes. And always headed to and from those uh, milkweed patches and the the trees and shrubs along the river. Even this little tiny one about 15 inches long, is really cute. This is a desert king snake, I only saw this one. Don't know how common they are down there, but just the fact that it was round means that it can't exist there. And the same with uh, patch nose snake. I've probably seen maybe three or four of these down there. Um, and this is the only coach whip, the Western coach whip that I saw. So there could certainly be more of those there as well. Um, lizards are great predators of everything, particularly the arthropods. This is a New Mexico whip tail. When you see a whip tail, New Mexico whip tail, you know it's a female because they're parthenogenic, just like the white turkeys, and um, they don't need males to reproduce. And there are a lot of them along the bike path, along the milkweed stands, and you see them crawling up uh, the shrubs and up the vines of the milkweeds, and, and uh, they usually startle you a little bit. They come out in the sun on the bike path, so it's not strange at all to see a um, whip tail. And also these spiny lizards are pretty common. I'm not exactly sure what species this is, um, but they uh, great hunters of arthropods out there. One time I, I pulled up and I was looking through this stand of climbing milkweed for insects and about, oh, again, about that foot, foot and a half away, here's this lizard that's probably about half a foot long, maybe, maybe five, six inches long, kind of looking at me, staring down at me. Again, it's one of those things that gives you a little start, even though it's not going to hurt you. You just say, well, I shouldn't be there, but here it is climbing up to the milkweeds, hunting arthropods. For the ants, the ants are probably the most numerous insect out there. Um, I saw this Texas horned lizard out there uh, feeding on ants along the bike path. 
really refreshing to see. I don't see them often. And so this was a pretty unique uh, series of shots on a horned lizard that had happened in. Um, for the fish, you have a lot of aquatic birds. This is a grebe, a uh, western grebe, and it had come into the quiet water because the wind was blowing so hard out on the, the main river. And so I was fortunate enough to get some relatively close-up shots of the grebe, and it was in there trying to catch um, shiner minnows and whatever smaller fish were around. So a, a vertebrate feeding on vertebrates. Um, great blue heron, this is a, a young one, very young one, and it's feeding in the area where red spotted toads had, had uh, originated. And so there might be toad tadpoles it's feeding on as well as arthropods. And I really like this patch of, um, this is actually ditch bottom, that big drainage ditch. And this one uh, was really, really allowed me to take a lot of shots. It, it didn't get rattled, it didn't get spooked. And when it did finally get tired of me taking shots of it, it would fly about 40 feet to a culvert and stand here. Now I nicknamed this one Tagger because of all the graffiti I'm pretty sure that it painted inside this culvert. For some reason it loved to go to this spot when it felt a little bit threatened. But this habitat that we just saw for Tagger is right here and this is how it changes within a month when they have to come in and do management activities along the ditch. All that vegetation that was in there has been removed, and so it now has to start anew. So this, these are highly managed habitats, but they're still valuable. And I love to see great blue herons in flight every once in a while with a camera that has stabilizers in it. You could get a halfway decent photo of a, of a great blue heron. I really like that image. Egrets, there are lots of egrets out there. This, uh, the great egret, not so much. I've only seen one or two of them. But snowy egrets, the, they had a roost over on campus right near University and Espina in those tall trees, and they would come out and forage away. Uh, and I just love taking pictures of snowy egrets. They, they pose so well. And, um, you just can't get enough of these guys foraging along. And, and, and feeding in these semi-aquatic habitats. Again, they take, they, they're more apt to eat predators of milkweed foragers than they are milkweed foragers, but there are thin strips of oral milkweed along these habitats, so they could be eating both as part of their diet. This one's zoned in on somebody. And uh, always try to get them in flight. Snow egret have black legs, yellow feet. Uh, so it may, and black beaks, that makes them a little easier to tell. But if you can get a good wing shot, they, they really make a nice um, wing shot. If you can just get it timed right, it's all about patience and timing. Cattle egret are real common out there. I believe these were introduced from elsewhere, perhaps Egypt or someplace like that. There are quite a number of them around. Uh, I don't know if, if there's only one of them, if you should call it a cow egret or not, but uh, they are called cattle egret. And these are very common and, and uh, these are actually just a little bit shy, so they're sometimes hard to get good images of. Uh, this one was a little ruffled when I started taking photos, but came out as a pretty nice shot and you can see a little bit of the, uh, the laciness in the feather pattern there. Black crown night heron. This one was scared out of the uh, river by some rafters and so it jumped up in his cottonwood tree for a perch and I happened to get that shot from the bike. Um, here's an adult and a baby, black crown night heron working along the bank early in the season. <clears throat> and here's an adult feeding in that large drainage ditch. Uh, and it was, it was real steady. It never flinched once about me sitting there, maybe 30 feet away taking images of it. So I was lucky to get these shots of the black crown night heron, which oftentimes you don't see during the day. And uh, I actually saw them twice, three times during the day during this, uh, this group of settings. Beautiful orange eyes. And uh, really like these feathers that almost look like, um, almost look like cordage coming out of the back of their neck. I don't have a clue what purpose they serve, but they're kind of cool looking. Um, overflights of glossy ibis. You can tell they're ibis with their down curved beak. This is just testing my camera against flying birds to see if I could get a halfway decent image. And this is pretty good. You can see the outlines pretty well. 
The ibis tend to forage in the pecan groves under the pecan trees. And I don't ever see them right along the river, so I wouldn't call them a predator, but I thought I'd throw in an image just because they're interesting. Um, one snow goose, only snow goose that showed up, uh, showed up in the winter time, and it was sitting with a whole bunch of ducks, and they like to forage uh, in the aquatic edge where a lot of the juvenile um, milkweed foragers and also the predators mostly of milkweed foragers, not so much the milkweed, milkweed foragers so much, but uh, the predators of them. It, it, it's one of those things you find. Green winged teal are quite common in the late fall and winter. It's a male. You have female, male, male, female. Um, real pretty to take uh, images of if you can get good sunlight. And they do a lot of foraging again in the semi-aquatic zone where a lot of the larvae and, and eggs and the next generation of some species of arthropods are. Mallards um, <clears throat> nest on the edge of the river and they, <coughs> excuse me, are real common throughout, I believe this is the one they call the Mexican mallard. Often see ducklings in the, through the early part of the year. And they take these ducklings up on the dry grass and under the milkweed plants to forage. And they will eat practically anything. They can get their beaks around. They're just real rabbit foragers. And they're cute as heck to watch. Here you can see they'll, they'll forage along this a zone where a lot of uh, damselflies lay their eggs and the things of that nature. And then they mature into a more recognizable mallard. And there are also some standard colored mallards out there. The typical ones we see where the hand and the drake uh, have very uh, different coloration. Again, you get the right light, get great photos out there. Cinnamon teal, beautiful, um, and they forage like crazy through all of that semi-aquatic vegetation all through the winter. They're there about two or three months during the winter. Just beautiful, beautiful birds. Northern shovelers, the same thing. These are both drakes. Got that big old beak and they can scoop up so much sand and larvae and eggs and everything else. Uh, and then, again, they're there all winter. Uh, sometimes they they let the ladies come in and forage as well. Gadwalls, same thing. They're out foraging a lot. And they tend to be around for a couple of months. One of the most common ducks are the American Widgeon. Drake, hen, and a mallard. Shows a size difference. And the good old American Coot. They're always constantly looking through these semi-wetlands and wetlands and also in the aquatic system for anything edible. They will eat anything. And so they uh, also are another level of vertebrate predator. Turkey vultures kind of hang out on the poles and sun. This one was about 30, 40 feet away from the path when I took this image. Um, and they, um, you know, they're only going to be around if big stuff is there. Usually they just stop there to rest. I don't know if they actually drink out of some of the water sources there. They may, but I think they just stop to rest. If there were some large critter like a jackrabbit or a cottontail or something lying out dead, I think they would scavenge, but otherwise you just see them around. Um, this is a snake shot out on Hornada Road, but I thought I'd throw them in because it's kind of cool. Same with this one, a little bit closer to them. and They were out scavenging for cottontails. Uh, this is one of the deadliest predators in the winter time, and it, it normally eats other birds, northern harrier. And uh, here it's um, captured a teal, and it's getting ready to have a nice meal, on, a nice teal meal. And always flying over, always hunting, always hovering. And again, I am always tempted to try to take an image, see if I can get a decent one. Here one is being harassed. I thought this was a raven at first because of the round of tail feathers. It might be a crow, but it was sure harassing that harrier. Um, Cooper's hawks are bird hunting, hunting hawks, and so they go after a lot of the wintering birds and the birds that come in early to breed. This one had a, a bad right leg that it has to live with, so I nicknamed it Lefty. And here's one who was out in the cold morning in a cottonwood tree. 
and just ruffled up every feather it had. It made for a really cool look, really angry look once it saw me snap the images of it. Uh, Swainson's hawks, you see them commonly flying around, foraging through the whole area. They'll, they're really great, great snake hunters. They'll pick up snakes right and left, but also other species of uh, small mammals and amphibians and things like that. So this is a pair of male, female, Cooper's hawk, I mean, excuse me, Swainson's hawk. And you see them occasionally out there. red tail hawks are quite common. This is a young one perched right above a stand of whorled milkweed and just looking for anything from small bird up to cottontail size, maybe jackrabbit size. Again, you'd always try to get the wing shots. They're tough to do, but every once in a while you get one that turns out pretty well. I like this one because of the way the, the uh, finger feathers curl and the pattern. And this one at a distance had a lot of color. It was a mature bird. The way you tell um, red tail hawks real easily is this barring, this chest pattern. Very, very unique. And this is another young one that was out uh, just this last spring hunting over uh, stands where milkweeds are. Milkweeds weren't in flower, but it was hunting other stuff. Frugia's hawk, real common all winter long. They're really an elegant bird particularly when you can get them on a perch where you can get within reasonable distance. And they're not terribly shy, so you can actually get a fair number of shots um, of them in their hunting prime. And they'll take anything up to jackrabbits in size, um, or they, they hunt mammals. Um, and when you catch them in flight, that's, that's really a cool situation too. Most common falcon, the American kestrel. These are deadly on grasshoppers. They love the grasshoppers, catch an awful lot of them. Also, they catch a lot of lizards and um, could catch small mammals if they're out. But uh, the most common falcon you're gonna see out there is this small American kestrel. And they're really cute. They're, and so every time you see one, you wanna take an image of them. So you end up with more images so you can imagine. There are some bat boxes placed out there in, in uh, bat habitat. I have seen one dead bat that had a yellow body in a milkweed stand. I've never seen them, flights of live ones because I'm not out there in the evening. And, but this uh, falcon figured out pretty quick, I know where the food is. All I gotta do is wait, patience. Uh, again, you just can't help but be taken in by these little guys and wanting to, wanting to take a photo of them. Color pattern is really pretty if you get the right sun. Gamble's quail, there are several uh, that nest along the willows and they go after these all sorts of bugs with gusto for their own meals, but also when they have young, they're just um, out there cleaning up bugs everywhere. It's fun to watch them uh, stand guard while their young are out feeding and, and they're always calling back and forth and you all are familiar with Gamble's quail, so I won't dwell. Killdeer, very common. And uh, foragers on the upland a lot, particularly when they have young and uh, big foragers uh, in that, that uh, shallow water edge. Uh, they pick up, again, a lot of arthropods in their foraging. Uh, these don't really like each other, but they found a good place to eat. So they, they're kind of hanging out together. Could be social distancing. They just don't want to breathe in each other's face. I'm not real sure. Uh, and the little guys, awfully cute. But boy, will they put the bugs down so the, the adults run around catch lots and lots of bugs. These nested right in a, a stand of world milkweed. A couple of avocets showed up last year. Uh, not much of a player in terms of eating things up because there's, there weren't very many in short term, but they're just pretty and unique. It's fun to try to get photos of them. This little sandpiper shows up in the late fall. I think it's a semi-palmated sandpiper, and they just get in the shallow water and go after anything and everything they can find. Again, if there are larvae or eggs, uh, small vertebrates, things like that, these guys are gonna eat them down. The common snipe, I see quite a few of them out there. And they'll usually pose because they rely on their coloration. Um, this one sitting on uh, right next to the channel and this one is making a nice circular pattern. This is one of my favorite photos ever. It's this nice circular pattern in the water made by this common snipe. Again, foraging for all those things. 
Um, rock doves, they don't really, or pigeons, don't really feed on arthropods that much, but they do feed on the seeds of the plants that are produced under the milkweed stand. So occasionally you'll see them out there feeding uh, uh, as a seed eater and watering nearby. The same thing with the white winged dove. And here's a little baby white winged dove I saw this spring. I thought he was kind of cute. And morning doves. They come to these water sources to drink and uh, are seed eaters. But they're also prey to a number of the raptors. Um, the introduced Eurasian collared dove. And so you get uh, a lot of the harriers and uh, other falcons will, will take them. Roadrunners, uh, they win the award for being the velociraptor of the, system, of the system out there. They will eat anything. I've seen them, I've seen them grab Sonoran bumblebees. They smack them until they're dead, swallow them down. I've seen them grab tarantula hawk wasps. They smack them around until they're dead and they, they swallow those down. Um, this one had, I counted four grasshoppers in its beak. It was getting ready to take it back to its young underneath a batch of uh, willow shrubs. And they would certainly feed on the uh, wasps and bees that have um, burrows out here. If they could get into those burrows, they would certainly feed on those as well. Um, and to show you kind of what they're capable of, uh, here's a, a pair of youngsters. These are our babies that were hunting out in an area where there used to be scattered milkweeds. And it was after a big rainstorm and, and they were actually picking up insects that had been knocked to the ground and couldn't fly yet. They were too wet and cold and beat up. And so they were just really thoroughly cut. But this is another photo from home. I actually watched a roadrunner swallow a uh, mockingbird whole head first. Um, the mockingbird was harassing it. It just grabbed it and there was so much squawking you couldn't believe it. And then all of a sudden it's gulping and choking that thing down and it put it down whole. So never underestimate what a roadrunner can eat and get down its gullet. It is, like I say, it's the total velociraptor and it will, uh, it will take you on, take on anything almost. So hummingbird, uh, black chin hummingbird, uh, I saw a fly around climbing milkweed flowers a couple of times. I don't know if it actually nectars on them, it takes nectar from them, but it might. And it, uh, when they have babies, they also take tiny flies that might fly around those milkweed stands. Uh, belted kingfisher shows up uh, to eat minnows, uh, so it doesn't have any impact at all on the, uh, on the insects or arthropods, except for the fact that the minnows might, uh, might be chewing on their larvae and eggs. Northern flicker, up in, a tr up in a cottonwood tree here. I like the way they balance themselves against the tree with their tail. Um, but they do come in under the milkweed stands and along the willows to go after grubs and larvae that are in the soil. So they could actually take larvae of these, uh, these wasps and bees that are uh, pollinators of the milkweed flowers. And they're uh, winter visitors, winter users. Have the black phoebe and the says phoebe and they're both really great insect catchers and so all season long you'll see them uh, sniping at the various insects that are available uh, in these um, patches of milkweeds it's a nice little shot of one sitting one flying early in the spring says phoebe here's looking at you uh, the kingbirds again are, are very voracious insect eaters it's a, one of the really efficient fly catchers that are out there. Uh, Ladderback woodpecker mostly stays in the tree. I just threw it in because I like the color pattern. Uh, barn swallows, the, um, a lot of nesting goes on under the bridges and then the adults take the young out and teach them to fly and then they feed insects that they capture over the tops of milkweed and other places. Um, they, they park the young ones and they bring the, the, the insects to them and it's really fun to watch them feed um, try to get images of them. Usually they're too far away. They're pretty shy when they have babies. Common crow, what can you say? Winter time, they're there. They probably eat most anything. They can get their beak around. Um, a lot of pecans. You see a lot of pecans dropped on the bike path and out along the river. Um, but they do come into the water 
and it's right in here where they'll take water, but they'll also eat anything they see uh, that might be larvae as well. Roost tree. There's a big uh, flock of them going to this pair of roost trees. Here's a Chihuahuan raven. They came into this pole along the bike path and they were having a little bit of a commotion over who really should sit on top of the pole. Uh, but I rarely see common ravens in a group. It's usually only one or two. So this was kind of a unique little setting. Uh, not enough of them around, but if, if they were around, they could actually um, forage on some vertebrates, that sort of thing. Western bluebirds come through, uh, but it's mostly wintertime, uh, and they may take insects and larvae if they can find them. Northern mockingbird year round, and they take a lot of insects. Here's a northern mockingbird outside my kitchen window, so that's a cheat shot. Curved bill thrasher, they're all over the place as well, very common out there, and they eat a lot of insects, a lot of grubs, a lot of caterpillars, so they're, they're a vertebrate that is quite a predator of, of all things arthropods. And they always look mean, look like they're ready to just gulp it down. And all these pictures are along the bike path. This is the more tame portion of the bike path of my, of my uh, valley road. Uh, Phanopepla is another insect eater that, that is in for the year and breeds in cottonwood trees that have mistletoe patches. Loggerhead shrikes, very common. They pick up a lot of grasshoppers and lizards and, uh, and uh, are constantly out hunting. This is a yellow rump warbler. They come in a little bit late. They, they winter, and so um, they take up uh, some insects, as do as does this warbler. I'm not really sure which one it is. Might be a ruby crown keelin. These desert cardinals or pyroloxia come in in the wintertime. They winter there, and uh, they do a lot of seed foraging underneath uh, stands of milkweed and underneath the shrubs. So this one's got a whole mouthful of seeds it's putting down. They're very, very unique looking birds. <laughs> the only picture I ever got of a rufous sided towhee, they're around, they forage around under the leaves. So I'm assuming that they would take uh, insect larvae if they, if they uh, came across them, maybe even adults. And the white crowned sparrow, it's another wintering species and, and uh, they're just fun to take pictures of, but they eat a lot of seeds that are so, and can be seen on the ground under these patches of of the plants, savannah sparrow, same thing. Um, Red-winged blackbirds, many, many, many of them, all breeding season, all summer long. And uh, they feed on all, all insects that are semi-aquatic um, and along that river's edge. So they're, they're great predators of the, the various insects along the way, as are Western meadowlarks. Western meadowlarks are more spring, fall, spring, fall, winter residents, but uh, again, they're, they're great predators of all the, um, all the insects around. They also forage a lot in the dry grasses where the wasps and bees would have their burrows. Here's one with at least two grasshoppers in its mouth that it's going to take to the young. Yellow-headed blackbird just kind of pass through, so they probably eat a few insects, but they don't stay around very long. Great-tailed grackles, same thing. They, they they actually nest once in a while, so these 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 can uh, eat a lot. But they tend to hang around where people are and, and eat garbage more than they uh, feed along the river along the river out where the milkweed patches are. This one is up in the in the uh, campground area or the uh, picnic area, I should say, looking for grubs. Brown-headed cowbird, only saw them once, so I don't think they're a big factor in in anything. House finches are common and they eat a lot of uh, seed primarily until they have young and then they go after the insects. Same with the blue grosbeak, speak, seed eaters, but when they have young, here's the grasshopper. So they will take insects when they're feeding babies. Pocket gophers, nature's little rototiller and uh, they're constantly looking for roots. They don't eat milkweed roots, but they burrow right up next to them and aerate that soil. So they're pretty valuable in that regard. Bunnies come in and, and eat some of the understory plants. 
related to the milkweed stands. They don't eat milkweed. Milkweeds are pretty toxic. Um, but you have other predators that come along and, and uh, go after the bunnies. And one of the amazing things to see, I, I'm always surprised by it as a jackrabbit hopping down the bike path, the jackrabbit trail. And you don't see them often, but every once in a while you see one and it always kind of startles you. Oh, that shouldn't be here, but it is. I did see one striped skunk that was out a little out of its burrow a little uh, late in the morning. One time, looked pretty, pretty unsettled, so I didn't stay around that long. And they will eat almost anything they can get their teeth around as well in these habitats. This is a cheap coyote shot that I took out by Dripping Spring on Dripping Springs Road. Um, it's one that's going after a cottontail and is really intent on that. But I see a lot of coyote tracks, and so I just threw this in as one of the vertebrates that visits there. We do have some feral animals. Here's a kitty cat trying to hide from me from taking its picture. And I see this one often out there. And it, uh, they take a lot of birds, other vertebrates, lizards. They'll eat snakes, and, and uh, they'll probably eat large insects like grasshoppers as well. And every once in a while you see uh, dogs that are running out on their own. And uh, they don't really eat too much. They might chase a rabbit around, but it's uh, just something you run into as you're out there. So I have run you through almost every image I have, and I hope you weren't too bored by it. And if you stayed around this long and this Zoom is still working, then um, more power to you, and I really appreciate it. And I hope you, uh, Hope you saw something you liked and or heard something that was interesting. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for hanging around. <laughs>